Welcome to How I Built My Fundraising Consultancy, the stories behind the people driving results in the nonprofit sector. We aim for a grade level of around six in fundraising, which is pretty low. And I think a lot of us struggle to write at that level. I know when I started my career and I was an academic writer, it was really hard to get down there. I was writing at 12th and 15th level, you know, things like that, which is the way you're supposed to, but not in fundraising. Hi there, I'm Tim Chen, Marketing Solutionist at MarketSmart. Today in the show is Jeff Brooks, fundraising consultant and fundraisingologist at Moceanic. Jeff's expertise is in writing, so on today's episode, you'll learn some great tips on how writing for fundraising is a bit different from other industries. You can find more information about Jeff Brooks at www.jeff-brooks.com. Here's my interview with Jeff. I'm here today with Jeff Brooks, and he's with Moceanic. Welcome, Jeff. Hey, glad to be here. Glad to have you on the show. Before we are going to dive into what you're up to now, I just want to dive a little bit into your background. Uh, it looks like you're, you were big in the writing and music in college. Can you kind of go into your, your background uh, getting into the fundraising realm? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, you'll probably find it's like most people's. It's, it's circuitous. I was a music major in college. I assumed that's was what I was going to do with my life. I wanted to be a classical musician. But sometime in my senior year or so, I suddenly realized I kind of love music too much to make it my career. <laughs> <laughs> because it becomes your career, you have to you you have to do certain things that you know mm-hmm. becomes necessary. And I, and I knew a lot of professional musicians who were really miserable. So I you know I, I was close enough to my degree, and, and a music major is actually tough. So I wasn't going to just let it go. So I finished it up. And it was a, a music composition major. Uh, you were. Oh yeah. my goodness, that's even worse. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was a um, performance major. Uh, yeah, composition is like even more difficult, right? Yeah. What instrument were you just out of curiosity? Bass. Okay, wonderful. Right, so I still play the bass. I play in community orchestras. I have no need to make money off of it. I just get to participate in beauty. Yeah, and you're on the board of an orchestra, is that right, currently? I am. I'm on the board of the community orchestra that I, that I play in, which is kind of one of those things, like if you play in the orchestra for a certain amount of time, you are sort of obligated to be on the board. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you know, so, so yeah, the board is mostly made up of members of the orchestra. Okay. With a, community members Interesting. Um, yeah yeah so your shift to writing yeah was writing always something you enjoyed or was it something that you kind of had to make yourself learn the like i always liked writing in college writing was kind of what made me successful i wasn't that great a student but i can write good papers and i and i, I would hear this from professors they'd say i just love reading your papers <laughs> so i could be like kind of mediocre as my ideas could be mediocre but my papers were fun to read i then went to grad school in literature and i heard the same thing from professors there i said well you need to de- deepen your analysis but your writing is so good <laughs> and, and i was actually teaching at the time and i, and I know exactly how to feel when you read your students papers there's always a couple that you look forward to because they write well, and mm-hmm. most of them are torture. You know, it's just hard to read their stuff because they're just not very good writers. So I could see where that came from, but that sort of gave me the sense that hey, I can write. So I pushed forward and I and I worked hard on it. That's what's been the sort of the foundation of my fundraising career is that I can write. <laughs> Once you focus in on something and get some expertise on how the thing itself works, you've got a career. It's kind of that simple. Yeah. So you go from grad school where you're studying writing and literature. Do you go directly into Merkel and True Sense and other nonprofit geared organizations or do you do some other work prior to that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of. Well, I actually kind of had the same epiphany in grad school that I did as an undergrad. So I was on the academic track. Mm-hmm. I was going to be an English professor. In fact, that's kind of the family business. My father was a professor. My brother is a professor. And, you know, so I thought, oh, that's like, that's what you do. Sure. Yeah. If you're not a musician, then you're a professor, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I kind of got to that same place where I said, I love being on a campus and I love libraries and I love talking about books and I love, you know, I love it. But there's a lot more to the academic life than that. And a lot of it's really objectionable. So I actually kind of came to the same. I, again, finished, I got out with with the graduate degree and then I just started looking for work, not in universities. Mm-hmm. Accidentally got hired by a small fundraising agency. I say accidentally because it just kind of came out of the blue and I wasn't particularly even looking for that. I, I was, you know, I was looking for journalism jobs and things like that. Yeah. So I got that one. You know, it was a small agency, but I got well mentored there to know my stuff. Because as you know, fundraising is really weird. It's not like other kinds of writing. And it was rough. And I worked there for about two years and it was 
kind of a torment. Yeah. <laughs> The kind of writing I was good at was not at all like fundraising writing. And I just, I kind of had to be reprogrammed. My natural instincts were all 100% wrong for fundraising. What kind of instincts did you have to get over? To make your writing beautiful, to express complicated thoughts with complicated writing, you know, really academic or creative writing. And those are the kind of the two things I, I knew how to do is very self expressive mm-hmm. and complex, poetic, and, you know, things like that which is all wrong in fundraising. Fundraising is all about simplicity, directness, quickness. I just had to learn. Yeah. You know, the kind of writing that pleased me was failing at, at, at fundraising. It just doesn't do it just doesn't do the job. Did they let you send out some of the the things that weren't working just to to learn from or did it get stopped before it went through production? It mostly stopped before it got through. Mm-hmm. There was stuff that did get through that was wrong in those ways. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It was like, yeah, I didn't get to go 100% the way I wanted to, but I, I got to go far enough to fail. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. Was it a challenge to you to, to, to try to work in this new construct of, of writing? Oh, yeah. It was a real challenge. I hated it. Failing's not fun. There were times when I thought, you know, is there something else I can do? And I remember one time just thinking, I can't do this for me. I just don't get it. I don't like it. I don't like the audience make me debase myself and write this ways I don't like. Really, it's it's hard to make your living as a writing doing what you want to do. I think almost every writer who actually makes a living as a writer is a writer plus something, a writer plus fundraiser, a writer plus you know military issues, you know whatever it is. Like yeah. You're an ex, sort of have expertise in something, and your writing is how you express it. And I was wanting to be a pure writer, kind of can't make money. In the course of several years, I'd made a total of about 75 bucks and a couple of free literary magazines. <laughs> so that was the extent. I mean, when you're when you're in that world, you're just uh, you're you're lucky to get published at all. And you're even luckier to get paid. And it's usually like sort of a joke amount of money. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I was that's so that what I was thinking. I kind of for the time being, I stuck with it just because it was what was in front of me. Then it was kind of a moment where it clicked and I thought, oh, I get it. This is actually kind of fun. You kind of learn that there's a pleasure in that. It's different from the pleasure of writing to express your soul, <laughs> but there's a pleasure in, you know, making something cool happen by getting people to give. What have been some of your favorite writing projects for different nonprofits you've worked with? Well the cool thing about working at agencies, which is where I've been most of my career, is you get amazing variety. You know, you work with cumulatively over the years, hundreds and hundreds of organizations. One that kind of comes to mind is we had a client, this is back in the old domain group days, a client that really wanted to grow, but they'd kind of maxed out direct mail as a channel. It's like they were sent, they were doing as much direct mail as they could. Mm-hmm. They were using all the lists they could find that worked, you know, and that wasn't fast enough for their ambitions. So we thought, well, let's try other channels. This is before the internet was a meaningful channel. We went to radio, and it was just kind of an experiment at the time. I wrote these one-hour radio specials. It was sort of NPR-style reporting, but it was all fundraising. So it was actually a little bit more like the Ronco <laughs> pocket fisherman kind of thing, but with yeah. fundraising ask, you know. And we didn't know whether it was going to really work or not, but it worked like crazy. It brought in tens of thousands of donors, and, and it fueled massive growth. So it was a scripted radio show for an scripted like an hour. Show. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Hour long. And then you do all these 60 second spots. Do you have multiple people on this radio broadcast or is it a monologue for an app? Kind of like a news style. We would go overseas, you know, to tell a story of the need for the work of the organization. We'd actually go and interview people. So it sounded a lot like NPR. Okay. And you'd hear the the voice in a foreign language and then, then the translation comes in over it and you know, all that kind of stuff. One of the things that really increased calls was having the sound of phones ringing during the call breaks, <laughs> which is really crazy. Phones don't ring anymore, right, you know? yeah. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it really worked. So we learned a lot. It was kind of revolutionized that. And in fact, now it's hard to get into the fundraising radio business. It's a limited resource. Is podcasting something that you've worked with for clients? Is that even a thing in that I realm? I have never done that with clients. I wouldn't write it off. My reaction is, no, the do- donors aren't listening to podcasts. There might be donor audiences that are. So, you know, I wouldn't say no. Was your radio experience what encouraged you to start Fundraising is a Beautiful podcast? or Sort of, yeah. Mm-hmm. My co-podcaster, Stephen Screen, we actually worked on that client together. So we were kind of like radio nerds together about that. Of course, we'd never been the voice talent. <laughs> <or anything. laughs> right. 
we got radio and liked it. So yeah, it was sort of an easy thing for us to say, hey, why don't we try a podcast? Let's see how it goes. Yeah. Let's dive a little bit into your current role. So you're one of four people in Moceanic. What's What's your role there? My title is fundraisingologist. Uh, I think we're all called that, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Moceanic is a teaching fundraising organization. The the goal of Moceanic is to make fundraising around the world better by making fundraisers better. It's a training company. My role is creating content and coaching organizations. So you can get training with us. You can go to uh, basically webinars, a web-based training or you can do like one, you know, face to face or, you know, face to face through the computer mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> on your project. We have a variety of clients where we, we work directly with them. And it's the same thing. But the difference from most consulting is we expect you to do the work. You know, we're looking for the clients that they want to do the work, but they want to be as great as possible. So you're them teaching them the fish. Yeah, right. Whereas in, you know, most consulting and I, and I do other consulting, I'll do whatever they want to pay me to do. If they need copywriting, I'll do copywriting. You know, there is just, you know, get the job done. Whereas with Mosianic, it is really get the job done, but you do it. And we will equip you and help you and guide you as much as possible. For your coaching, is it a variety of one-on-one or do you also work with an entire board or a department? It's been both. Probably a little more one-on-one where you're, you're working, very, very typically you're working with a sort of a small shop and you're working with the person who writes designs it in Word, does the merge purge through some kind of simple database program and it handles the printing sometimes on their office laser printer, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Very often that's how it kind of goes. That that's what most that's where most of the fundraising world happens. So that's most common. I've also sort of worked with whole fundraising departments and more general training, like when we would talk about what do we do to think about this better? How do you think about upgrading donors and how do you think about thanking them well? Stuff like that. So you'll teach the general philosophy of fundraising and how to do a good approach. Do you dig in the nitty gritty stuff? Like you're a writer, will you teach people that are terrible at writing? Will you try to teach them some basics and improving that skill? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And the way to do it is we're working on your year end appeal and I'm going to help you think through the strategy first and then you're going to write it and then I'm going to look at that copy a couple of times until it's great. Okay. There's four different people on staff that Mosianic is accurate? That's right. What are the different specialties? Is there someone that helps with graphic teaching and stuff like that? It's five people. Excuse me. It's five people. Two plus of us are content people. Sean Triner is the other one who does basically the same thing I do. And mm-hmm. he's actually he's the founder uh, of the company. There's a couple of people that are very much involved in the sort of technical implementation of it. As you can imagine, anything that's web-based and global gets really complicated and it's way beyond technical abilities of people like me. There's a lot of work going on there. We have a project manager who's kind of specializes in technical things, and we have um, another person who kind of helps us uh, stay on track. And, and uh, as you can imagine, those of us who know how to do content tend to be not so great at meeting deadlines and doing the boring part of that. You know? <laughs> right. That's where we are. Where we're kind of going is getting other people delivering content that aren't really in the company. Tom Ahern, who I'm sure you know, is working on a, on a course that it will be a Moceanic course that he will deliver and we will sell and, and we'll see how that goes. And we kind of hope someday to have lots and lots of quality Tom Ahern level kind of people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which of course, there are very few of as many people possible in many different countries and languages doing that through Moceanic. Okay. So the business model now is they're paying for one course and they get access to that course. They're paying for training. And is the, yeah. the training like an hourly or is it a per project basis? How do you guys price those out? There's a couple of ways. We have basically one product where, hey, you get 90 minutes of me, plus I'll do some homework mm-hmm. for a set price. And there's another product. It's a little bit like the courses, but it's delivered directly to you with back and forth going. So there's kind of those two ways. We call it coaching. Yep. You know, because it's not the same as consulting as coaching. It's about making you better. So far, it's mostly been somebody who wants to make their, uh, you know, such and such appeal better. And they want to work on this appeal with me or with Sean. That's what we do. Okay. Now, I was going through the website and something I noticed uh, with the branding uh, basically like comic book art style was that sean's idea or what was the inspiration behind that i think it's sean's idea <laughs> the sense that it's fun that yeah. this stuff should be fun is kind of kind of the, the the point there do you outsource that creative work to 
to get that those illustrations done or is someone in-house doing those? We outsource it a little bit, but you'd be surprised how much stock in that style is available. And you can put in whatever words you want to that style. Yeah, you put too. in keywords that you search. Yeah, right. Quite, quite often, actually, we'll say, well, we want something that's really specific, you know, too specific that it would be in the stock. So we, we do have a designer who does uh, an outsourced designer that we go to and say, hey, I want something like this and we'll describe it and they'll design it. Yeah. When you're developing the courses, what is the general format? Course is typically for 90 minute sessions and it is basically you're watching a PowerPoint while listening to the teacher talk. Sometimes there's the teacher's face is visible and sometimes not. Mm -hmm. Then there's after each session, there's a quiz, but you know, under the belief that if you do the quiz, it'll help cement the key concepts in your mind a little better. Also, you get CFRE credit if, if that's something you want, which a lot of people do. Yeah. And they actually require that there be some kind of written component. So that's what the, that's right. what the quiz is there. <laughs> okay. We have, we call it coursework and we can't force you to do it, but it's basically, you know, do a project like what we're talking about. For instance, one of the courses is called the um, Donor Connection Survey which is a really specific project you can do that has amazing power. To, it can make you tons and tons of money, and most people don't have any idea how to do it. So you actually go through, and at the end, if you actually do your coursework, you will have this project done and ready to mail and or email. It can be direct mail, and it could also be online, and ideally it's both. In that case, it's all about actually getting a thing out the door, including budgeting and everything. Some of the courses, like I have one called Irresistible Communications, it's a little more broad and open. You don't necessarily come out with a project, even though if you do the homework, you'll at least have parts of real work done. So the idea there is like not only to learn a bunch of stuff, but actually do some work. Mm -hmm. In yeah. the coursework, I don't check everybody's work. So I don't, you know, who knows? I have, I have a feeling that not everybody's doing it because I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> right. even if I meant to, I might not. Yeah, that's just the way people are. We do have kind of a course community area, sort of a bulletin board sort of thing. And people do post their stuff. We do talk back and forth, both Sean and I, and then the students among themselves talk. So there's, there's kind of a community thing going on too. Okay. You being on the board of Providence Hospice of Seattle for nine years? Yeah, I was just recently, yeah. What kind of takeaways did you have from your time there that as you work with boards and teach them and train them that you're... Yeah, well, it's interesting because, you know, it's kind of like for a lot of us in fundraising, the board is the enemy. <laughs> right. I have to say, though, that that particular board was not. It was a good board. Didn't run into that. So, but you can kind of see why boards are the way they are. I mean, they're just a bunch of people trying to do their best. And they're usually experts in something else. And I think it was just sort of the personality of that particular board was they weren't micromanaging fundraising. They, they really, they just did their things and, and tend to do them well. I, I think what I learned most about on that particular board is some fundraising offers are really difficult. And hospice is one of those. It's really hard to sell the idea of supporting hospice mm -hmm. to anybody who hasn't been through a hospice experience. That's kind of the case. The only people who donate hospice are usually people who are family members of somebody who went through it. And that includes me. Yeah, it's like, who could ever value this thing where everybody dies? Yeah. You know, you, know, you don't save any lives. Actually, you do occasionally. But that's not, you know, that's not the typical thing that happens. It feels grim. I almost want to say it makes death beautiful. It doesn't actually make it beautiful, but it makes it it pushes it toward beauty and it makes it yeah. less difficult experience when it you know when it goes the way it's supposed to go. It's a memorial giving thing. Anyway, what I kind of learned there was you have to figure out your audience. Something I, I think we all know, but it's like you realize it kind of in a radical way. This is something you could not sell to the public. It would not mm. go. You have to figure out well who wants to support this. Yeah, it's actually a really really limited group of people. And mm. so that's a whole different challenge. Yeah. And then I guess the last question before we get to the lightning round is, as a writer, what are some of your favorite tools? So the tools, I, I, you know, I mostly use Word, but Scrivener. Oh, I love Scrivener. Yeah, I, I use that for larger projects because it's really good at sort of sorting stuff and moving it around. And it, it has this feature I, I love, feature where you can like turn everything else off and all you see is a white screen with, with black type on it. Yeah. I like that a lot. Well, I, I guess lots of programs have that now, but the, the sorting feature. So I've written my all my books that way. And it, anything that's kind of longer, I'll, I'll use Scrivener to do that. Another one I love a lot, and this, this, this one's a free online tool, is Hemingway app. It is a reading grade level 
calculator, huh. which you could say, well, that's built into Word. Why do you need this? Well, this one's better. <laughs> it's a website, HemingwayApp.com, I believe. And there's actually a, an app version that you can download so you can work on, work on it when you're offline. And so you, you plug in your copy and it tells you the flesh Kincaid grade level. But better than that, it flags the sentences that you want to go to to fix it. <laughs> we aim for a grade level of around six in fundraising. Okay. Pretty low, and I think a lot of us struggle to write at that level. I know when I started my career and I was a, an academic writer, it was really hard to get down there. I was writing at 12th and 15th level, at, you know, things like that, which is the way you're supposed to, but not in fundraising. And that's a combination of the vocabulary you choose and sentence structure, I'd imagine? Yeah, it's actually, in fact, when I, when I started my career, I, I was pre-word processor, and I had to actually do this with math. But it's basically sentence length, and number of three syllable words. Huh. Okay. There's a calculation dude. I remember I would do that on paper. This is before we, <laughs> we had an uh, online application. Anyway, the, the Hemingway app not not only tells you your number, so like say you come in and oh crud, it's ninth grade, but it's too high, I need to lower it. Hemingway actually highlights the hard to read sentences, meaning the longer and more complex ones. And you just go to those sentences and fix them. It helps you fix it. Whereas Word just says, hey, you're at ninth grade level, go fix it. And then you have to like find where mm -hmm. the problems are. Yeah. It also looks up use of adverbs and a few other things that are not connected to reading level, but actually sort of connected to sort of quality of writing. So I love that app. That might be the best writer's app. I think everybody ought to use it and everybody ought to just worship it and share it and talk about it all the time because it's, it's just a great app. When we return a quick lightning round, first, a quick break. You've heard Jeff talk about the importance of great writing. Well, today's free resource offer is the ultimate guide to writing major donor letters. You can download this at imarketsmart.com slash major letters. That's www.imarketsmart.com slash major letters. Here's what you'll learn. The four types of letters you should be sending your major donors, what you need to know before you begin writing, how to design your letter to be scanned before it's read, how to craft a compelling call to action, how to adopt a you mindset and make the donor feel like a hero, and much more. Visit imarketsmart.com slash major letters to download your copy. That's imarketsmart.com slash major letters. With that, let's get to the lightning round with Jeff. What's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? Don't do things you're bad at. What piece of advice would you have for yourself as a 25-year-old? Don't be so dedicated to what you think is your career path now because it could change. Do you have a favorite fundraising book? I love Tom Ahern's books. I I'm just going to cite a few authors, okay? Because some of them have more than one book, uh, and usually all their books are great. Read him. Read Gerald Panis, Mal Warwick. Harvey McKinnon's books are great. There's a number of books that will, tr if you haven't read them, they will transform you. Do you have a favorite or best under $100 purchase you've made in the last month or so? I bought a desk lamp a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> it was like 25 bucks, and it has really improved my work area. So if your lighting wherever yeah. you work isn't good, that's actually a pretty good purchase. What's an interesting or fun fact about you that most people don't know? People are surprised that I live in Seattle. It's a great place to live. I love it here. Uh, I hope not to ever leave here. As a writer, do you have a favorite word? Harmonious. Desk or car, what would you clean first? Probably pick the desk because I spend way more time there than in the car. <laughs> Tea or coffee? Coffee. What's the most common error you see nonprofits make and how can they avoid doing that? By far, the biggest problem is they think they can raise money by explaining what they do and they put all their energy into you know, having a brand promise and a elevator speech and that all their fundraising is basically, hey, if we just explain how awesome our processes are if we everybody will give which is completely wrong it is a complete waste of time it doesn't work uh it works with your mother they just need to get out of their own heads and yeah. start doing raising that's a that's about donors and about what donors can do you're a tool to your donor you need to start doing fundraising with that assumption rather than if they just understood us they give that is like almost a universal problem. It affects large organizations, it affects small organizations, it affects people who should know better, it affects people who've never thought it through, 
it's just kind of it's sort of the default way fundraising is done. You kind of need to be in the donor's shoes for a bit to get their perspective. Right. right. What charities do you admire or support? Providence Hospital of Seattle, Seattle Philharmonic Orchestra. I kind of like small organizations where you can have a more of an impact. In terms of others that I really admire, there's a kind of a handful of really smart, large national charities that I like them just because they're realistic and they do things right. And that would include Food for the Poor mm-hmm. and St. Jude's uh, Children's uh, Cancer Center. Those those two particularly are, they're large organizations, you know, and they're encumbered by some of the stuff that really ties down a lot of large organizations, you know, like um, they mean it about fundraising and they do what you need to do and they're doing great great work yeah they are for sure those especially just i love their focus where can people find more information about your services and oceanic yeah well uh, moceanic.com is where you can learn all about all the things you can do we have there's a moceanic uh, blog there too it's a good blog you could go to my blog, futurefundraisingnow.com. So I blog in those two places. Also, if you wanted to work direct with me, not in a learning way, but a more of a consulting way, you could go to jeffbrooks.com. And that's Jeff with a hyphen in between Brooks. I don't remember how to say that because I don't want you to type the word hyphen. Right. Jeff and Brooks.com. Awesome. And then, uh, yeah, make sure to check out Funnery is Beautiful, uh, your podcast with Stephen Screen. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. We post approximately every two weeks. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for your time. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of How I Built My Fundraising Consultancy, presented by MarketSmart. If you like this show, make sure to review it in iTunes and pass it along to a colleague. If you are curious about what we do, check out imarketsmart.com and don't forget to download the ultimate guide to writing major donor letters by going to www.imarketsmart.com slash majorletters. Thanks for listening.